Uh, we're going to talk today about the comprehensive behavioral intervention for Tourette's. Um, my name is Doug Woods. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And uh, you might have been hearing a lot about behavior therapy for Tourette's or CBIT. And that's really what this talk is about. We're going to try describing it this morning. I'm going to, my intention of this next hour and a half is to get you to understand what behavior therapy is, why one might consider it as a treatment for their child, and or, their, or themselves, actually, because it, it, it's useful for adults, and then describe some of the evidence behind it and talk about some of the concerns that people often have about it, because I think it's important to kind of think about all of that together when making treatment choices for your child. Um, I want to start with the behavioral model of tics. Now, I think it's important to understand why we're doing this because I think it sort of demystifies it. A lot of times when people hear about the idea of using behavior therapy for a neurological disorder for, you know, like tics, uh, I think there's a lot of concern. Like, why would you do behavior therapy for a neurological condition? Does that really make any sense? Well, before we even start about why it really does make sense, I think it's useful just to think about that this isn't unusual at all, this idea. I mean, if you have a stroke, for example, obviously a neurological problem. When, after you have a stroke, are you always incapacitated the way you are right after the stroke happens? No. You recover a lot of functioning in many cases. And how do you recover that functioning? You recover it through therapy. What kind of therapy? Physical therapy, occupational therapy. And both of those are various forms of behavior therapy. It's repeatedly practicing a behavior over and over again, learning a new skill, learning to overcome a neurological deficit. This isn't anything different. Okay. OCD can be very effectively treated with behavior therapy. It's a neurological problem, and it can be overcome with behavior therapy. So the idea that behavior therapy is somehow odd for a neurological condition really is, is sort of old thinking. We know that behavioral procedures can change the brain. That's what they do. And so the, the, that's where the, sort of the basis for this is. So let's talk a little bit about why um, this might make sense from a per perspective of tics. Well, we know, and a lot of research and, 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 and research dollars goes into understanding the brain and what's happening when people tick. What's, what's the root problem, so to speak, in Tourette's? Now, I'm not a neuroscientist. I, I, can't, I can barely pronounce half the words that neuroscientists say, and, and that's okay. Um, I don't need to understand exactly what they're saying, but I can generally give you an idea of what the problem is. Think of the problem in Tourette's as something like this. You have this genetic predisposition that leads a certain portion of your brain, a part of your brain, to form not quite correctly. All right? Now, the part of the brain where that gets the most attention, there are lots of different problems that, 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 that happen, but the part of the brain that gets the most attention is, are the CSTC circuits, the corticostriatothalamocortical circuits. These are loops in the brain that control different aspects of behavior. Right? The, the S in that is the striatum. That has a couple different parts to it. We don't need to worry too much about what those parts are, but that striatum has a particular job. That, the job of the striatum is to determine which movements are appropriate for a given situation. All right? So imagine this. Up in your, the, the motor cortex of your brain, this part of your brain up here, are stored your movement signals. Whenever we want to do something, when we want, whenever we want to move, these cells get activated. These neurons get activated. These neurons send signals down into the basal ganglia, or the, the striatum. Okay. These cells, these signals that are sent down, are little pieces of movements. They're not full movements. They're bits of movements, parts of movements, okay? parts of sounds, if you will. And these bits and pieces all get sent down for all the possible things we could be doing at that given time. Now, some of those, most of those signals are stopped because they're not appropriate for a given situation. Many of those signals, or some of those signals that are appropriate for that situation, get let through. They're, they're allowed to proceed through, they connect in with the thalamus, and then they get executed ultimately as movements. All right. Now, what is a tick? A tick is a little bit of that movement that slips through when it shouldn't. All right. It's that little bit of movement coming from up here that goes through the basal ganglia, slips through when it shouldn't get through. All right. Now, in, in the, the striatum, we talk about how do you know whether something's should, should be allowed through? How do we know whether it's appropriate for a given situation? How do we know whether the striatum should block that little signal coming through or whether the striatum should keep that signal coming through? Okay, that's the question. Well, the basal ganglia also gets a lot of feedback from other areas. Uh, the striatum also gets feedback from other areas of the brain that, that are sensitive to reinforcement, sensitive to changes in the environment that come right after a behavior that tell the brain, hey, whatever you just did there, do it again. That, was, that felt good. 
So for example, if I have an itch on my body, I could be doing lots of things. I could keep, be keeping my hands down, I could be scratching it, I could be looking over this way. All those signals are coming down into my brain. My brain says, hey, the last time you felt all that stuff, you scratched and it felt good. Do that again. Okay? And so that, that's the signal that gets allowed through, the one that goes like this. The rest of them get blocked. The head turning gets blocked. The putting my hands down gets blocked and all that kind of stuff. So the brain, that striatum, is sort of like a gatekeeper. And feedback from the environment, when a behavior happens, if something good happens, that, that feedback says, hey, let whatever happen go through again. Or if something bad happens, the, the, the feedback is, hey, don't do that again. Stop it. If the, the, the striatum lets those motor signals go through and then stops or allows through, depending on the history of the, of the situation, certain signals. So what is a tick? A tick is one of those little movements that get through and then how the environment reacts to it is going to make a big difference as to whether it continues to go through again and again and again. All right? Now all of this is happening outside of your awareness. You have no idea the con uh, uh, that any of this is happening. Okay, this is all subconscious, so to speak. All right? um, so that, that's, that's kind of the basis for this. This is where we're going to start. That's what leads to ticks. But we know, as I said, ticks happen in the environment. There are environmental reactions to the ticks. There are things that happen outside the person's body that after ticks happen. There are things that happen inside the person's body after ticks happen. And those two things, those two reactions to the, body, to the tick, external and internal reactions, can make the tick worse than they need to be. They can strengthen the tick. Okay? All right. So let's talk about that. Talk about antecedents and consequences. When we talk about how the environment, both external environment and internal environment, how those two factors affect ticks, we break them down into, into two groups. We talk about antecedents and we talk about consequences. Antecedents are things that happen before ticks that tick, make ticks more or less likely to happen in a predictable way. So for example, places, situations. You can all think of, if, you're, if you think of your child, are there certain situations or certain places where their ticks tend to be worse? Everybody can kind of say, yeah, I can think of that. Are there certain people when that they're around that their ticks get better or worse? Yeah, you can usually think of that too. Um, I've heard cases like, oh, I, my, my son ticks all the time in front of my wife, but never in front of me, or very rarely in front of me. I hear that kind of thing. So you get people that can, make, that can push ticks around predictably. Activities. My kid's playing sports, he never ticks. Or he's playing video games, he never ticks. But he's, he's sitting there doing homework, he ticks like crazy. He's in school, he doesn't tick. He's at home right after school, they blow up. I mean, on and on and on. These are very reliable, predictable things. And you all know they're there. I mean, I, I'm sitting out here and I'm watching heads and smiles and like, yep, 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 yep. And so we all know that that's true. There's also internal experiences. You know, ask your child, if you haven't already, do you feel the ticks coming on? either a little tightness in the area where the tick's happening or more of a global feeling throughout your body, and they're going to say, yeah, I feel it. I feel like you know, it's building up and then it releases when I tick. Okay, that's another thing, that when that's present, that feeling's present, they're more likely to do the behavior. There are also consequences to ticks. ticks are th consequences are things that happen after ticks that make ticks more or less likely to happen. These can be reactions to ticks. So when people say something after a tick happens, like com uh, uh, attention that they might get, or laughing from a peer, those kinds of things. Or it can be escape from things. And we'll talk about examples of that in a little bit. There was a, um, well, so let me back that up. We know that there are events in the world that push and pull ticks. So that's, that, that's one thing we have to consider when we're thinking about using behavior therapy for ticks, that there are factors in the world that push and pull ticks. We know that events in our own body can maintain ticks. So, you know, we get this reduction of the urge that follows the, the tick. You know, they feel buildup of tension, they tick, and the feeling goes away. And we know that the point of behavior therapy is to change in the environment in order to change the ticks. So we figure out what these events are that push and pull ticks. We uh, figure out how to change this situation a little bit, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And we do those two things together, and that's called behavior therapy. <clears throat> and how do we do that? Um, we talk about changing antecedents, and we talk about changing consequences. What are some antecedent events that impact ticks? There was a study done by Raul Silva in 1995, and he asked a group of people with Tourette's. He had a list of things that could affect their ticks. And he, he asked for each of them, he asked the group of people with Tourette's, does this make your ticks better? 
Does this make your ticks worse or does this not affect your ticks at all? I'm going to argue that this was actually, for its time, probably one of, if not the most important behavioral study ever done in Tourette's. Dr. Silva disagrees with me, but that's his own study. But here's why I think that. He found this. When he asked about being upset or anxious, he said he found a large group of people with Tourette's found that being upset or anxious made their tics worse. A large, uh, smaller group said it made their tics better, actually. Being anxious or stressed actually improved their tics. And a third group said it didn't affect their tics at all. Watching television. For some, it made their tics reliably worse. For some, it made their tics reliably better. And for others, it didn't affect their tics at all. Being alone. For some, it made their tics worse. For some, it made their tics better. And for some, it didn't affect their tics at all. Being around other people. For some, it made their tics better. For some, it made their tics worse. And for some, it didn't affect their tics at all. Now, you might be thinking, why on earth does he think this is so important? It seems kind of like maybe Dr. Silva was right. Maybe this study wasn't so important. But I would argue that this study sent two very important messages at a time where there wasn't much recognition that the environment could influence ticks. And here's what the message it sent. First of all, that these people with Tourette's could tell you exactly what was pushing and pulling their ticks around. They knew, they knew when it was happening. They knew what factors were hitting them and making their ticks harder to control, harder and more frequent. They all, the other part, important part was with that was that everybody was different. The factors that impacted patient A were very different than the factors that impacted patient B. And what that tells you from a therapeutic standpoint is A, if you change the environment, you may actually be able to reduce some ticks, and B, that you're going to have to take an individualized approach to it. You can't do just a one-size-fits-all thing. It's got to be done in an individualized way. We have seen other things, too. Stressful life events can alter ticks. Um, hearing other people cough can talk about ticks. Um, talking about ticks can make ticks worse. We, we know that, and we've, we've shown that experimentally. And we might think about, you know, all these things, you know, Tourette's seems sometimes like a really bizarre kind of condition, but it's really not that far out of normal. It looks like it is, but it really isn't. It, it operates within our, you know, our brain that, that pretty much is, for most parts, intact. <clears throat> so what do I mean by that? You know, like this whole idea about talking about ticks. How can talking about ticks make ticks worse? Well, we all have a little bit of that. I mean, we're all that way to some extent, maybe not with ticks, but with other things. So if I go like this, <laughs> How many of you want to yawn? Okay. This is a perfect example. How many of you did yawn? About 5% of you who actually wanted to. And so you had the same thing, those, those neurons up there that tell you, hey, mimic, what, they're called mirror neurons, mimic what other people are doing. That's a good thing. They fire off. They t send the signals down to do something. Your brain knows don't do it this situation, not appropriate for this situation, and it stops it, it inhibits it, okay? And then you don't yawn. A person with Tourette's yawns because their brakes don't work. You know, that, that part of the brain, the striatum, is about 5 to 10% smaller in volume. The dopamine system in there that is supposed to be there for regulating, it doesn't work so well. So you, it, they would do the same thing you would do. It's just the part of the brain that that's supposed to stop them won't do it, okay? So that, that's really kind of what's happening. So it's not unusual that these kinds of things, these kinds of things occur. Um, premonitory urges are another antecedent event that makes ticks worse. When this feeling is there, the ticks get worse. And what is a premonitory urge? It's that feeling that you feel right before you have to tick. If you want to, I forget who it was, I had a patient once who told me the best way to understand what a premonitory urge feels like is to open your eyes really wide and don't blink. Just stretch them out. Do that now if you can. And, and feel that feeling around your eye. And pretty soon you'll be feeling some kind of weird, I don't know how to describe it, around your eye. And then go ahead and blink. And you'll notice it goes away. Kind of goes back to normal. Okay? Think about feeling that, being bombarded with that constantly. You know, that's, that's kind of what a premonitory urge would feel like. And then it would go away. And what would you want to do? I mean, you'd learn you'd want it to go away because it stinks. It doesn't feel good. And so you start getting that behavior that takes it away, and you do it more and more and more because you're bombarded by these urges constantly. What about consequence events that can impact ticks? Well, consequences, reactions to ticks, can make ticks more frequent or less frequent. How can they be made less frequent? How can ticks be made less frequent? Well, everybody with Tourette's has the ability, or at least many people with Tourette's, 
have the ability to suppress their ticks for short periods of time. Okay? We all know that. Um, they can kind of hold it back for, for a short period of time. That behavior is, is something that could be reinforced, could be strengthened. And how, what kinds of factors go into strengthening the reduction of ticks? Well, what do people, why do people suppress their ticks? They avoid being teased. That's a reinforcer. They are able to do social activities or sports that they may not have been able to do, so they, they try to hold their ticks back for a short period of time so they can do that. They can avoid being embarrassed. They can ask the girl next to them out on a date. They can do, I mean, there are all kinds of things that, they can do that anyway, but they, they kind of think that they can't, and so they, they, they reinforce the suppression. But we can also, uh, and also, by the way, you've you got to wonder, I mean, I hear this a lot as a clinician. My kid doesn't tick much in school. In fact, when I told the teacher he had Tourette's, they were like, really? Really? I would have never guessed. But when he comes home, it's just tick from the minute he walks in the door to the minute he goes home, or the minute he leaves again. So, you know, why is that? Why is it that he's not ticking much in one situation than another? Maybe there are different consequences for the ticks in certain situations. Maybe he, there's a lot of reinforcement for not having ticks when he's at school, for example. What about making ticks more frequent? Social reactions. <clears throat> Well, after we tick, a lot of times there are, there are social reactions that can happen. There was a study by Watson and Sterling that found, they were reporting on the case of a, I think a seven or eight year old girl. And this, this girl had a, a number of ticks, but one of the most bothersome ticks was this repetitive coughing tick. And they found that it happened most at the dinner table when the, when the child was eating dinner. That was when it was elevated the most. So they went in to watch the reaction, uh, interaction between the parent and the child in this situation. What they saw was something like this. <coughs> Stop it. <coughs> Can you be quiet? <coughs> Can you just please give us a few minutes of quiet? <coughs> Stop. <coughs> You're going to have to go. You're going to have to leave the dinner table. <coughs> that kind of interaction. That was it pretty much throughout the meal. So Watson and Sterling had this assumption that maybe the parent's reaction to this wasn't helping. Okay? Maybe what we need to do is do something like this, where we say, you know what, from now on, ignore the ticks, don't react to them, and talk to her about her school day, nothing else, just about what she likes to do, what she did that day, for e whenever she's quiet for like 30 seconds. So if she gets a, a period of 30 seconds in there, even if her mouth's full of food, and that's what's making her quiet, for 30 seconds, when she's quiet, then talk to her about her school day. Because right now, you know, before treatment, there was nothing, no talk about anything but the ticks. And so they did that, switched it, and within three days that tick was nearly gone. Okay? Now it still was there because the biology hadn't been fixed, but the, the environmental effects, the effects of, of the learning there had been scraped off. All right? So this, this kind of social reaction can make ticks worse than they need to be. Not that they cause ticks, they do not cause ticks. You don't learn to tick. But the, the, the environment, the reactions to the ticks, the can make the ticks worse than they actually need to be. All right? Think of it this way. Now, if you're a, if you're a parent of a child with Tourette's, which most of you are, um, you know, and you have a child with a very like, violent head jerking tick, and it seems to happen most often when he's sitting next to a wall, and he kind of likes that feeling of the smack of the, of the head into the wall. You know, if you're a child, if you're a parent of a child like that, and you see your child starting to do that, and, and they're, they're going like this, and their neck's hurting, and they're rubbing their head, maybe crying a little bit, and it's, it's getting really tough. If you have any kind of soul as a human being, and if you want to have any decency as a parent, your first reaction should be to go over to your child, hold them, make sure their head's safe, tell them it's okay, tell them you're going to get help, you know, maybe cry with them a little bit, rub their back, you know, all that kind of stuff, that good parent stuff. That should be your natural reaction. All right? A lot of love, a lot of attention, just heaping it on right there because you want to protect them. All right? Kind of get that. Now, my question is, when they're not ticking that much, do you do the same thing with the same intensity? And you can admit it. You probably don't. Okay? I'm a parent of three. I don't. Okay? When my kids are quiet and not beating the hell out of each other, then I'm not there. I'm, I'm, I'm silent. I'm getting other things done. I'm thanking God that they're not beating each other up anymore. And all is good. In fact, I don't want to interfere at that point. Whatever's happening, it's happening right, and I shouldn't be involved. When I get involved is when the problems start, right? 
And so you, if you think about that from the perspective of your child, now again, your child isn't thinking about this consciously. It's not something they're aware of is happening. They haven't put it together. But what's happening is they, they get a big bunch of ticks, and mom and dad show up and give a bunch of attention, love, hugs, kisses, all that kind of stuff. When I'm not ticking, I just go about my day. Okay? I mean, you think about it. Nobody's doing anything wrong in that situation. It's just, is that the best situation? Is that the most useful way to approach it? You know, where the ticks get all the attention and the, the quiet doesn't. You know, is that the most useful way to, 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 to approach it? Now, I'm not saying let your kid you know, bang their head into the wall until they go unconscious. I'm not saying that at all. You, know, you always have to keep them safe. You're never, ever putting your kid at risk. But there's a way to keep them safe in that situation and not really react to it. And then there's a way to, to react to it. Um, so that, that's what I'm talking about here. There's also peer attention. Imagine the child who doesn't have many friends and they start doing a tick in class that gets a lot of laughter from the peers. You know, is, is it safe to assume that that might actually make the ticks a little worse? Now remember, the child's not thinking, I'm going to tick so I can get my peers to laugh. That doesn't have to be the case. Remember I said the basal ganglia, the striatum, that lets stuff through subconsciously. So the tick slips out, that little, you know, you know fuck, slips out, and the, the, the reaction from the peers is laughter, and that feedback gets sent back to that, that the striatum and says, hey, let that through again. That was good. Let that through again. Now, this isn't happening consciously. It's just happening. All right? So is it safe to assume that peer attention could make this a little worse than it needs to be, potentially? Escape from an aversive situation. Imagine this. Child sitting there, third grader, in class, and the, child, and the, the teacher says, okay, we're going to walk around, uh, we're going to take turns reading. So I want everybody to stand up at, when it's your turn and read a, a paragraph and then sit back down. Okay? So you've got the child who doesn't read very well, but he's got a loud vocal tick. And for those of you with Tourette's in the audience, I'm going to mimic some. This will probably bother you, so close your ears or something if you don't want to, to be feeling a little more ticky than usual. Um, so the child stands up, and it's his turn. He doesn't read very well anyway. He starts com uh, comprehensive uh, uh, behavioral inter intervention for uh, ticks. Uh, uh, part, part, uh, part one, the teacher's all, all uncomfortable. Kids in front of him are uncomfortable. The kid himself is embarrassed. What does the teacher do? The teacher does what we always tell teachers to do. Why don't you just put that down, go to the nurse's office, get your ticks together. When you calm down, you can come back in. Thank you. Go ahead. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Teacher's doing what the teacher needs to do to preserve his own feeling. I mean, he's taking care, the teacher's taking care of the student. The teacher's taking care of the other kids in class because he's trying to make sure the other kids can learn. You know, they're taking care of their own sanity in a little way, you know, just because it's like getting too emotional and tense for them. So they do that. And most of that is right. Most of that is okay. But what's the one wrong thing they did there? Reinforce the behavior. In what, in what way did they most importantly reinforce it? What was the worst part of that move? The worst part of that move was you don't need to do your work anymore. Go. The go wasn't bad. The go was okay, actually. The worst part of that was put the work down. You don't have to have any responsibilities if it's too hard for you when you tick. That's not a good message to send. You know, that, that's the wrong message to send in a lot of ways. What would have been the right way to say this, in my opinion? Why don't you take that reading and go, you can go to the nurse's office. You know, if it's, tough, if it's tough to cope right now, I get it. Bring that work to the nurse's office and you can do the work with the nurse. That's wonderful. You know, there's no, your life's not going to change. We're not going to let you out of responsibilities because you have this tick. You still have to do the work. Maybe we'll have to change how you do it or make it a little different for you to accommodate for you, but you're not getting out of it. You know, and and that's, that's the dangerous road because everything the way we would normally act naturally, that all of our instincts to protect our kids sometimes work against us in this way. And so we have to be careful. You know, we always want to protect our children, but we want to do it in a way that teaches them that the ticks are not a ticket out of anything. They don't you know, they, they'll we may change how we do it, but they're not an escape valve, so to speak. Okay. <clears throat> the reduction of the premonitory urge as a result of the tick. And this is an important one. Remember, people talk about this urge building up right before the, the tick happens. The tick occurs, and then people experience relief. So it's like an itch on your body. You itch, you scratch, and you get relief. Okay? 
The next time you itch, you're more likely to scratch quicker because it feels good, feels relief. Think about your alarm clock. Your, the first time you get a brand new alarm clock, except these iPhone alarm clocks. I still haven't figured out how to turn those off. But you, you get a new alarm clock, and the first time it goes off, beep, 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 you, you turn on the light, you look around, put your glasses on, try to figure out where the off button is. You just start banging around until the thing shuts off. All right? It takes maybe two minutes to turn the thing off the first time. Next day, a little faster, a little faster. Two weeks later, beep, poof. You don't even have to open your eyes. You know exactly how to reach out and smack it. You've gotten better because you've learned that behavior takes away this negative thing. And you get faster, you get more efficient, you, get, you, 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 happen, you don't let the alarm go off as long. All those things happen. And the same thing is true for urges. People who have had ticks for a long time and you know, uh, have learned that the ticks take away the urge, they tick at the slightest detection of an urge. It's like that urge just creeps up a little bit and boom, there it is. Because they know they don't want it to get too big, they don't want it to get too bad, take it away quickly. Okay. So you get this repetitive, sort of habitual sort of uh, activity. A little bit of an urge shows up, the tick happens, the urge goes away. A little bit of an urge pops up, the tick happens, the urge goes away. Now these pe the people with Tourette's aren't aware of it. They don't know a lot of times that this is even happening. Okay. But if you probe, you find out that it does. Okay. So again, to de develop intervention, we take that basic background knowledge and we realize that the effects of the environment are unique to the individual. To develop a useful treatment, both the external and the internal factors must be addressed. External factors need to be addressed through what we call function-based intervention, so, and we'll talk about that. And internal factors need to be addressed through habit reversal, which we'll talk about as well. Let's talk about function-based interventions. This part of treatment, uh, this, what we call function-based interventions, is the purpose of it is to identify the environmental events that exacerbate or maintain ticks for a given child. You'll notice I didn't say cause ticks. I said exacerbate, like make worse, or maintain. Keep ticks going when maybe they normally would have faded away. We, we find what these events are, and then we modify them in order to reduce ticks. Okay. So what does this look like? Imagine this situation. What we would do clinically is something like this. So we would interview with the parent and the child, and we would sit down and we would ask them, think about your child's ticks in the last week, maybe the last couple weeks. And I, we're going to talk about a lot of different situations that could make your child's ticks worse, that reliably make your child's ticks worse. Can you think of times in the last week when your child's ticks just generally happen more frequently or more intensely? And the mother thinks about it. She says, you know what? After school, every day, that's when they're most likely to happen. That's when they explode. And so what we do as a psychologist is start looking for patterns at that time. What's happening in the environment at that time that we think might be associated with the ticks getting worse? So I start asking mom, well, tell me about after school. Tell me the typical day after school. And the mom says, okay, well, I'm a single mom. I've got two kids, all right? I get home from work about the same time they do. My daughter goes downstairs. My son comes home a little bit later, like five, ten minutes later. He comes home from school and he's stressed out and anxious. His ticks are always worse when he's stressed out and anxious. You know, he's been just uptight about school all day. So he goes to the den where his sister's watching television. The den's in the basement. And she's already down there watching TV. And he starts ticking. He does a lot of loud vocal ticks when, when he's down there. That's one of his big ticks. And they really just explode right after school. Um, this gets his sister upset because she can't hear anything. He, she starts teasing Billy, gets really angry at him, and then starts making fun of him. And then pretty soon he gets upset, and there, he's crying pretty soon. He's a little bit younger than she is. And so she starts crying. Or he starts crying a lot. I hear this. I hear them fighting. So I go downstairs. I was trying to make dinner. I go downstairs, and I send his sister out of the room. I look at her, and she's being mean to Billy. I just can't stand it. I send her out of the room, and I, I look at this poor kid, you know, this eight-year-old kid. He's crying. I feel bad. It's probably my fault because my dad had this, and I probably gave it to him. And, you know, so I feel bad. I feel guilty. I feel like I want to help him. I feel like I'm not doing enough. I feel like I'm a bad parent, blah, 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 blah. So I go up to him, I hug him, I tell him it's going to be all right, I rock with him, I tell him I'm going to get him help, you know, I calm him down, I say, why don't we have a good rest of the night, watch some TV, relax, and when you feel like you can do it, we can, we can you know, have dinner and have a good night. All right? That happens four nights a week, at least. Okay? So as we're hearing this, we're thinking, we're breaking it down. We're thinking, what are the antecedents, what are, what's happening right before the tick that could be making this tick worse? And there are lots of things in here. And then we also think about what are the consequences, what's happening right after the ticks, reactions to ticks, that may be making the ticks worse than they need to be. 
And so what are some antecedents? Well, Billy's anxious. That could be something. That's you know, when he gets hyped up, his ticks happen more. It's also when he's in the den. When I talk to mom a little bit more, I find out that, you know, when he goes outside after school and plays outside, his ticks aren't as bad. When, when he helps me cook dinner, helps mom cook dinner, his ticks aren't quite as bad. But when he goes in that den and just sits there, it gets worse. Okay, so that's an interesting thing, and mom can tell me that, so I take that information. Consequences, what's happening right after the ticks happen that could be making the ticks worse than they need to be? Could be, I'm not saying they are, but they could be. Well, what changes right after the ticks happen? Billy's sister gets sent to the room. Okay, now that's an important one, because if you understand how siblings relate, one of the greatest joys in any child's life is to see their sibling get into trouble. I mean, that is like wonderment to them. You know, my middle son goes out of his way to get that entertainment. He'll set up that entertainment. Um, so you, his teasing sister gets sent to the room. There's a little bit of juice to that. Billy gets the mom's love and attention. You know, mom's a single mom. She doesn't have a lot of time. But when, you know, the one time she gets really, gets a chance to get really close to Billy, you know, is that time. You know, she tries to put him to bed and everything. And that, that he, she might get it there too, but he gets a, lot, a big heavy dose of love and attention when there's this big burst of ticks. Billy gets the TV to himself, so he doesn't have to watch Hannah Montana anymore. He gets SpongeBob back on. You know, so there's, there's something there too. Now, is that to say Billy is a, a budding little psychopath who's out to control his world through ticks? No, not at all. Not at all. He doesn't know this is happening. We, can, we always learn things out of our own awareness. That's, our brain does not need us to be aware of anything for learning to take place. So if we have that, what might we do in terms of intervention? Well, if we think anxiety is making his tics worse, we'll teach him relaxation strategies. Very quick, simple relaxation strategies that he can use in situations where he's stressed out. And that will help him control his tics when, his tic, when he's relaxed in stressful situations. So we'll teach him how to do that. Instead of having so much downtime in the den, we might schedule activities after school, get him outside to play, schedule a play date after school, have him help in the kitchen, um, or limit the amount of time he's just sitting there right after school if that is where his ticks get worse. What are conse consequences? Instead of having the teasing sister sent to the room, we don't let her leave the room, we ask her to apologize. Maybe we bring her into the therapy sessions to let her be part of the treatment plan too and help out her brother. Um, instead of mom comforting Billy, we say, look, we want you to pay attention to your child. We want you to love your child. We want you to provide affection to your child. Just don't do it in great big doses when he's having a lot of ticks. You know, do it when he's, his tick time is down. Make a special effort to go spend, you know, five, ten minutes of very close time with your child when he's had a, a, a kind of a, a, a reduction in ticks, like when the ticks are a little bit lower during the day. You know when that time is. Maybe it's right away in the morning. Maybe that's when he's not ticking so much. Spend that time with him then. That's when you give him the hugs and the kisses and, and you make that effort to spend that same amount of time that you normally would have spent during a big tick outburst, spend it when there's tick down time. Okay. Um, Billy getting the TV to himself, you know, contrary to what most children will think, they will not die if the TV or video games go off. Um, so you can always uh, reduce that amount of time uh, and, and limit the amount of time they spend in those high tick risk times.